The Roots of Gold Faded Family are in the manuscript collection MSS 084, housed at History, Colorado. J.J. Brown was an owner of the Ibex Mining Company, husband to unsinkable Margaret Molly Brown, and father to son Lawrence and daughter Helen. J.J.'s epic gold discovery was thought to have been in 1893, but Jody alters history through her own discovery at History, Colorado. How does a checkbook become a story? Without the staff here at History Colorado, there's no book. And if, if you have the delight of the century to just dig through boxes of archives, this is your place. I say this is the slot machine for researchers because you don't even realize it's raining or snowing when you're in this space. Um, and I spent five years digging through the archives here. And let me tell you about it. And they told me I can't lecture, so this is your brief little lecture note. <laughs> MSS 084, which is referenced in the book constantly and over, stands for the manuscript collection of Lawrence P. Brown. And Lawrence P. Brown was the son of Margaret and James Joseph Brown. In 1957, these 14 boxes of stuff were dropped off here. And they were sealed until 1976. And having talked to the family recently, I think there were reasons that the boxes were sealed. <laughs> and when you get to the end of my book, you'll understand what I mean why the boxes were sealed. Because it is raw, it is personal, it is personal letters, it is maps that are in these 14 boxes of stuff. So how do you take that and make a book of it, right? So I didn't come here to, to write a book. I came here because I was at the Molly Brown House Museum up there on Penn, and I was volunteering, and I wanted to know, were they really millionaires? And if you're going to write a nonfiction book, there's only two ways that you can find an answer to that. You can talk to somebody unless they're all dead, which is a problem in a nonfiction book, or you can dig through boxes to find your answer. And that's where I started my quest here was in these 14 boxes, and we've pulled out three sets of things that are integral that were those moments in the book where you said, oh my God, this is a story. And that's where this first one comes in. Do you even write checks anymore? <laughs> right? Here's what we're losing with PayPal. Yeah. We're losing this right here. Because in box nine, folder 136, not that I memorized that, <laughs> because I kept going back there saying, it can't be right. It can't be right. Because all along at the Molly Brown House Museum, I'd been trained to say 1893, that's when he became this millionaire, right? 1893, Jody, just memorize that date. So I come down here to History, Colorado, and I see this blue thing right here. They told me I can't touch it. I used to touch it. Maybe I can touch it again. This right here, right here. Carbonate National Bank, Leadville, Colorado. I'm going to invite you to come up in just a second to take a look at it. But I'm going through these folders, and in this massive collection, here is this blue checkbook. And I touch it. And I open it like that. And I go to the first page. Now, when you write out a check, right? There's a little stub that stays. See, now they got me all nervous about opening the checkbook. Whereas before, I'd go, hey, I found the checkbook, Jory. <laughs> right, Jory? That's what I said. I found the checkbook. Yeah. So I open up this checkbook. I'll invite you to come up. Come up. Come up for a second. What does that say? What is that? There's a purple ink stamp. What does that say? November 10th, 1892. So the first dividend check, right? That's what it says, right? Yeah. Yeah. $2,500. Yeah, more than that. Well, that was for one. Right. So there's seven shareholders. What does that say? Dividend? Number one. Number one. Okay. Thanks for helping. <laughs> Appreciate that. So 
I was trained all this time to say 1893, and I open up this checkbook, and it says dividend number one for the Ibex Mining Company, and it's dated November 10th of 1892. And I say, wait a minute, he found the gold earlier. So that's what this collection meant to me was all the time we were saying 1893, all of a sudden, it's actually in 1892. And he didn't discover the gold in 1893 because that's what the Herald Democrat newspaper put in. And if you go to Colorado Historic Newspapers, is anyone familiar with Herald Historic Newspapers? If you look there in 1893, they trumpet that this gold, yes, thank you for putting it up on the screen. If you see that, it says greatest on earth. And it's dated 1893, right, Shelby? Yeah. So here in the archives is the original dividend one. And then we're disputing the gold found in 1893. And you say, well, that's really good. But how does that become part of a book, right? How do you use that to write a book? So that's where the story grabbed me. And I put in the book... His father was frustrated, striking nothing but solid quartz. Snow blocked the roads to Leadville and covered holes where a horse fell through the little Johnny shaft. How do I know that? Huh? It was in a newspaper account. Undertakers dug graves in the summer as preparation for burying those who died during the eight long months of a Leadville winter. Another fact that you glean from reading newspapers. All his life, J.J. believed in God and work. Without faith, you would be like the hired man who moves along with the clock, interested in nothing but the hour or time when he may lay down his tools. And so day after day, he worked the little Johnny. And that quote comes directly from this collection. The men were worn out. Work days began in pitch darkness, riding in a crude elevator that was little more than a cage that grazed the walls. Okay, how do I know that? Fact comes from a newspaper. Water dripped on the men. At the bottom of the shaft, faint lights from cap oil lamps. Had to research that. What do you wear in 1892? Right? At the bottom of the shaft, faint lights from cap oil lamps disappeared as miners moved around corners. <clears throat> men became so covered in dirt and dust that pickaxes appeared to be in the hands of phantoms. Finally, in the spring of 1892, they found it gold. So I come out and I don't say they found the gold in 1892, but by going through this massive collection and weaving the quotes, you've got a story, right? It's not just some dry fact where you go, woohoo, I found the checkbook, because it's a part of the story. So then I go on a little further, and A.V. Hunter, the Ibex treasurer, pried apart the drafts in a brand new checkbook right there, each stub had a place for a date. For efficiency, Hunter retrieved a purple ink pad and a date stamp. He turned the year dial to 1892, changed the month from October to November, and the date to the 10th. He wrote out seven dividend checks for a total payment of $20,000. So in that day and age, that $20,000, by the way, was about $600,000 in today's money. So suddenly, this checkbook actually puts you in the context then where you can figure out, was he really a millionaire? And that's what else you're going to come up and see on the table. You have these registers. And in the boxes, box 9, folder 136, <laughs> you have these. And so you can actually create a spreadsheet if you spend hours here with your pencil <laughs> And your paper, because you can't use a pen in here, and you've got to write it out with a pencil, you can come up with a total of $943,000. And without that donation to this museum and without staff here pulling that, I don't have that story to tell in the book. So here at the back, I actually put in the appendix. So someday when I'm long gone and somebody says, well, how much money do they actually have? There's actually a, a graph in the back of the book to say how much money did these people have. Now, we can quibble if they were millionaires or not, but I can say that from the checkbooks it was $943,000.
or equivalent to $30 million today. I think that was enough. <laughs> I could have been enough. Well, that um, was just the cash. I'm assuming they had other assets. Ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. If you get lucky and you find this fortune, right? It's like winning the lottery. So they went on spending spree. Should you spend it, right? So now you think it's... You, but they had the house. They had the house. Yeah. So, you know, I'd say they were millionaires. <laughs> what you find by going through... So in the collection here, there is map after map after map. There's all these maps of all the mining claims in Leadville. Oh. And then you can see how, what else he bought, trying, trying desperately to have that success again. And so in the archives here, you can go through and see he bought <clears throat> the Rex gold mine. And there goes $30,000. And then he buys this little claim outside of Gunnison the Eureka. So not only do you, you don't get the all 943,000 all at once, right? That's kind of the myth that we live under. But it was checks. He was just like a miner making $3 a day. How much money do you think we're going to have this month, honey? And so, so one month you, well, if you fast forward through the check registers, the money starts to go like this. And then you start spending $30,000 in a year, you may only get $6,000 in dividends. And then maybe your marriage goes south. Oh. <laughs> and it did. Maybe your marriage goes south. Maybe the kids need help. Anybody helping with kids these days? This family was just like today. They just started with a few more dollars. But you think that you're a millionaire, and then all of a sudden, maybe the money does start to run out just a little bit. So while we say that he was a millionaire, perhaps, um, in any given year, it may not have turned out. There were some very good years. 1895, 1896, the money's rolling in, we're going to go to Europe. You find the programs in this collection from when they went on trips. And when did we go off of the gold standard to the silver? Was that 1893? From gold to silver? Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're, there's, been a, there's been a lot of talk about J.J. and the silver crash and how it affected him and he found gold. But I'm going to turn to the checkbook again and say they had that gold, why they didn't. So I don't want to say they lied. Let's just say they didn't talk about it. And one of their good friends of the Ibex Mining Company was the newspaper editor of the Herald Democrat, who loved them who adored J.J. And once they found the gold, nobody said anything until 1893, and you know why? Because they didn't know the, where the vein was going to run. So when you go through the maps, was it going to go north? Was it going to go south? So what do you do? You find the gold in this spot. You buy everything around it. You buy everything around it. And you don't do that until you're sure, right? Or you do that, and then you say, oh, by the way, I found this huge vein of gold, but we bought all the land. <laughs> These guys were smart business people. That's the other thing, too. When you start going through this collection, and the John, there's some John Campion papers here, too. And there's John Campion, who was the head of Nature and Science. He founded Nature and Science up there in Capitol Hill. You go through his papers, you'll realize these people were smart, savvy business people. They were the Elon Musk and the Steve Jobs of the day. They really were smart people. So... <clears throat> In answer to this, where did you start and have this aha moment in the collection? I have to say that finding the checkbook was one of those miraculous days of my life where I'm touching something from 1892 and it solves this incredible mystery. And now we have the facts. We have the facts that we can actually say how much money in sincerity there was.